All right. Good evening, uh, everybody. We're here with the power of our story, our coffee and conversation, uh, where we welcome veterans, active duty, first responders, active and retired, along with caring bridge builders to join us for coffee and conversation. Coffee and conversation. Uh, tonight's guest is Kyle Overmeyer. Um, Kyle is an addiction advocate, a certified event interventionist, and a motivational speaker with over 20 years in law enforcement. He is looking forward to helping those struggling with addiction and mental health. Kyle is a regional director of business development in Ohio at Hickory Behavioral Health Hospital. He has utilized his journey of recovery by sharing his story and educating others that the disease of addiction and mental health does not discriminate. If you or a loved one is struggling, don't hesitate to reach out for help. You are never alone. So uh, I welcome Kyle. I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Uh, please share with us what you wish to share. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, would you like me to do a kind of an intro of who I am a little bit? You can add that to it. Absolutely. Give us a little I, bit more. Give us a little like bit that. more of who you are. I'd like to begin with, you know, I, I've had so many different titles along the way. Uh, I, I was the former sheriff of Sandusky County in Fremont, Ohio, the great Buckeye State, as we all say. Uh, a father, a husband, an ex-husband, a grandfather, uh, a re, uh, an addict in recovery, um, uh, a felon, uh, a former inmate, and soon to be, and you can uh, uh, thank Natalie for this, uh, soon to be an author as well. So I have a, you know, an array of titles that I'm proud of. And one of them, I tell you, I'm not going to lie, you know, being a, a, a addict in recovery and a felon, it's, it's changed my whole life. And I thought being the sheriff was going to be the pinnacle of my career, but I don't think I've seen it yet. Excellent. So kind of share with us that, you know, that road to recovery, what took place, uh, where you were at when you uh, kind of hit that downward spiral uh, of addiction um, and any other, uh, you know, tidbits of information that kind of set the stage uh, to start that uh, event. Well, um, you know, I, you know, I grew up in a um, unbroken home. My parents married now 54 years. Uh, they're still living. Um, my father uh, had 38 years in law enforcement, retired captain of Sandusky County Sheriff's Office, where I was ultimately uh, elected as sheriff of Sandusky County. Um, went to a Catholic school. I grew up a uh, football player. I wrestled and uh, I was a boxer and that will come uh, into play with what I do today. Um, grew up, went, graduated from high school, went to college, uh, was an art major. And after two years, I didn't know what I want to do. So I dropped out. And uh, I gravitated towards law enforcement, and my dad said, don't do it. But I, as you can tell, I did not listen to him. Uh, went to the police academy, graduated in 1995, and uh, was uh, full-time in 1996 as a corrections officer at Snooks County Sheriff's Office. Moved my way up through the ranks there, through promoted to road patrol captain, then um, I was, uh, the first time I was married, got married in, uh, 99, uh, had two children and, uh, I was really, uh, focusing on, you know, a law enforcement career to the point that I went back to college, obtained a two-year degree in criminal justice, then a bachelor's degree in business administration. And, um, ironically, I, I gravitated towards, uh, drug interdiction. And taking a lot of the drugs off the streets where I live, which uh, the crack cocaine epidemic had hit uh, tremendously. Uh, found myself then um, to um, become a detective after um, interviewing with uh, the federal system uh, a little bit until the sheriff then, who was uh, Sheriff David Gangler, said, you know, Kyle, I don't want to see you go, so I'm going to offer you a spot in the detective bureau. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I took it. I was a uh, a sergeant at about the age of 27, then about 28, he uh, um, promoted me to captain because I became very, uh, um, very pretty good at what I did. Uh, I partnered with a lot of agencies such as our local BCNI and I, DEA, and um, 
started to get a lot of major drug dealers off the streets. Um, from that point, uh, I then worked undercover um, for a few years, buying large uh, quantities of cocaine um, from the golf cartel, actually. I purchased up to 20 kilos of cocaine at a time and uh, went, it went by a different name, of course, for about three years and uh, had a lot of fun working in the undercover capacity. Uh, 2008, um, th during that time, the sheriff had came to me several times and said, you know, Kyle, I think you have a great career ahead of you, and I would like to see you end up following my footsteps and being sheriff someday. Well, at that time, I was only 33, 34 years old, and I was a pretty young guy. Didn't know, wasn't, didn't think I was ready for it yet. And um, in August of uh, 2008, the end of 2008, um, the sheriff then passed away. So we were, um, I was faced with an immediate uh, decision whether to, uh, either make the step at 34 years of age to run for sheriff or stay on uh, the capacity as a detective captain. Well, after talking with my um, wife then, um, I decided to make that step and uh, I beat uh, my opponent who had over 30 years in law enforcement and became the youngest sheriff in the state of Ohio at 34 years old. Wow. And still currently the youngest sheriff in, the, in county history. From that point, uh, everything was great. I was still married. I had two children and uh, did a lot of really good things. As I look back, uh, named 20 under 40 uh, individual in Northwest Ohio and Michigan for, you know, supposedly being successful by the eight before the age of 40 years old, um, distinguished service awards, a lot of accolades, and even um, was uh, applauded by our state auditor as the tax here, uh, payer here award, I started a jail garden actually for my uh, inmates to save taxpayers and rehabilitate and saved a lot of taxpayers. Uh, it even grew to a, um, a mini farm where I had our inmates raise uh, 80 broiler chickens actually every year to save on the food costs and to rehabilitate. But uh, during that time, because of my sports injuries, I found myself to have a lot of aches and pains in my ankles. So uh, I was then sent to a specialist to see what was going on. I was uh, diagnosed with arthritis. And of course, what did they give me? 105 Viking a month. From that point, um, I thought everything was gonna be okay doctor prescribes them, I keep start to take them. And uh, I had some traumatic events. Found myself in 2011 being in the middle of a fatal shooting where we ended up having to take a individual's life that pointed a shotgun at us. I was there with the SWAT team and was in, in the home with them. And uh, the family who wanted him out of the house turned and then ended up suing myself and uh, the rest of the guys for $20 million. Uh, Kyle didn't take care of himself. He took care of the rest of the deputies after uh, struggling with trauma because I was uh, Kyle Obermeyer. I was a sheriff. I was too strong for all that. And I had to lead the county. Well, I didn't let uh, that that was going on at the time. I was being sued. And then uh, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, on a February Sunday afternoon, we have uh, um, a river that um, runs into Lake Erie, connects with Lake Erie up here in uh where I was from in Fremont, Ohio. Uh, I was called to three children that fell through the ice with uh, several men. We went out, including myself, tried to save them, but didn't, they all dry, drowned in front of us. Um, again, Kyle didn't take care of Kyle. He took care of everybody else. And uh, the trauma got worse and the pills got worse. So I, uh, turned to more and more pills and it got so out of control. Um, I began to doctor shop, steal pills from the take back box. My parents, um, they both uh, were prescribed uh, uh, opiates for their uh, arthritis as well. Stole from them, stole from my daughter even when she would have her uh, teeth pulled and I become a full blown addict. Um, tried to hide it, got through two terms of uh, as being an elected sheriff. But uh, during, after, into the general election, um, uh, I was exposed. But prior to that, 
I was confronted by the pharmacist in 2015, February 2015, that I was uh, I was doctor shopping. So um, she contacted all the doctors that I was receiving the pre prescriptions from. And I went home that day and I, I flushed my last Vicodin down the toilet and uh, prepared to get myself clean. Well, I got sick, sicker. I detoxed myself. I was able to do it to manipulate my schedule and uh, hid it from my family. And I thought um, all my dirty secrets were never going to be revealed until um, I was up for re-election in uh, the general election in August of 2016. Um, they ended up a full-blown investigation with my medical records, taking pills from the take-back box. August 23rd, 2016, I was at the Sandusky County Fair as a sheriff for the ribbon cutting. And by that time at that night, at 6.30 at night, I was in an orange jumpsuit and a 43 count indictment looking at 15 years of prison. From that point, I found myself out on bond, but uh, my ego was so big and I was in denial trying to hide uh, my addiction. I continued to run for sheriff. November 3rd, they violated my uh, bond for uh, buying my son a crossbow for his birthday because it was a dangerous weapon. And that is when I started to come to terms that I needed to face my addiction and my trauma and start realizing what I had to do to make the steps to make everything better. I started to write letters, make phone calls to my family to confess about my addiction, especially my parents. Ended up working a deal to plead uh, guilty to 12 counts. And I went back on December 13th from the jail to uh, end up uh, for sentencing. The judge then said, Mr. Overmeyer, what do you have to say for yourself? And uh, I apologized to them. The courtroom was loaded with news media. This was such a high profile case. They were even videoing my residence of where I'd lived with my wife then. I went to the point of uh, apologizing to her. She said, I'm going to give you the best uh, treatment in the state of Ohio. I'm sentencing you to four years in prison. I ultimately then went on to prison, but that wasn't even the, the last wall that was co coming in on me. My wife and I had had struggles, and yes, Kyle had a girlfriend. Kyle had a girlfriend where they... Um, on the, after the day I was sentenced, they took my jail phone calls and released them in the news media to everyone. My, my wife, kids found out everything and that was the end of my marriage and a, a, a time of rebuilding a relationship with uh, my kids. So I can keep leading into where I am. I don't know if you guys wanna interject at all uh, you know what? I think uh, I, I just want to hear you uh, continue your story there. It's, okay. it's uh, yeah, go ahead, please. So my first 30 days were in solitary confinement. I was in the hole. Um, and if anyone knows about the hole, if they've run, done any real prison time, you really don't see anybody and it's dark for 30 days. It was to the point there was no clocks. The only way I knew what time it was to eat I would hear the, the metal wheels on the ground of the, the cart pushing the tray to trigger me to know it was time to eat. But those 30 days, I ended up were actually the best diets of my sentence. That's where I needed to find out who Kyle was, and I needed to have a long conversation with my higher power and uh, figure out what the plan God had for me. So I was either going to go one way or I was going to go the other. And I decided to go this way. So from that point, they took me and they wanted to put me in protective custody. I started my um, journey in prison in protective custody. As soon as I got off the bus, everybody knew I was coming and they knew what I was about. So one of the gang members that were running drugs offered me, of course, drugs right uh, immediately when I arrived. He said, the first one's on me, next one's on you. And my answer was, there won't be a next time. There's no. So I continued to stay abstinent from drugs all the way through. But 
solitary or protective custody is so controlled that it's really hard to move and it's like a big solitary confinement. So um, I went to the point where I um, had a talk and a meeting with uh, our warden and our um, assistant warden and asked to go to general population with everybody that even people that I had arrested. They were against it and they told me if I did it, I'd never be able to turn back. So I signed the documents and I gen went to general population. Amazing enough, my one roommate was a captain in the Aryan Brotherhood. He was uh, actually became one of the best actually roommates I ever had. He's actually in for a seventh number today. Um, shot tattoos. Yeah, I got a couple tattoos while I was in prison. I was in there for years and I was an inmate. Um, I wanted to embrace and understand not myself, but other people. My workout partner was a blood who was a Muslim. I took it upon myself to read the Quran and uh, did Ramadan for 30 days to understand his religion. I don't believe in Allah. I believe in God, but out of respect to understand. I wanted to know what he was about. If I was going to work out and spend time with him, I wanted to understand and educate myself. And yeah, in prison, there's only two things you can do, fight or something else. And I fought. Ultimately, I fought another gang member and yeah, I won. So they had nothing but respect for me and they knew I stood for my recovery and what I stood for. As time went on, I did as many programs as I could, which there isn't really much in prison. There's not. It's more of a warehouse, so to speak. It's utter chaos. There's drugs every day, hustling, stealing and manipulating. Inmates run prison. That's all I got to say when I was in there and the gangs. So I went through um, prison um, actually with no other troubles, but learning and understanding who Kyle was. But um, due to me knowing what my recovery was about and very vocal, I had several individuals that came to gravitate towards me who were struggling and wanted to, wanted to change. That's where I started to begin like, okay, this who might be who the new Kyle Overmeyer is. So I began to help the other inmates and kind of console and help them and try to show them a better way and be a leader and a mentor for them. And uh, I did pretty quite well where I gained a lot of relationships and still friendships today. April 6, 2020, I eventually got released. And also during my prison sentence, I got rid of that girlfriend and also my wife and I split up and ended up getting a divorce. Didn't see my children for four years, um, but we talked every day on the phone and continued to build a relationship. And I continued to be more and more honest and transparent about my addiction and my recovery and why I had done what I'd done and uh, gained forgiveness and began to forgive myself. So April 6th of 2020, got out, I was on parole, had an ankle monitor, and I found myself homeless. Didn't have anywhere to live. Um, my parents, I didn't want to put the burden on them. So I got scrambling, calling my parole officer, what should I do? Because I needed to find a residence. Found myself a residence then, um, actually to uh, an old uh, friend who, um, her and her partner had sent me uh, cards and would support me throughout my prison sentence. She ironically worked at the uh, community college that I was one of the board of trustees at um, when I was the sheriff of the county. So I had called her looking for that favor. And she said, you know what? I got an air mattress and an extra bedroom come flop. So I flopped there. And the next thing was with my six, uh, hefty garbage bags of clothes that all I had, it was time to find a job. Well, I was back in my hometown again. Where else could I go? So I went back to my old friend, Larry Bowman, who owns Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken. So he said, Kyle, I got a job for you. Got an opening frying chicken for nine fifty an hour. Mm -hmm. So that's where I began. But there was a little struggle with that. Being homeless, frying chicken back in your hometown where everybody wanted to get chicken. People got word. They'd come in, take pictures, put memes on Facebook, tell stories, make fun of me. And so it was time to either 
give up or turn it up. So I turned it up. I began to go a lot of AA, NA meetings, work, continue to work on Kyle, put some money together, then ultimately found myself to have a little part, apartment. And I went back to the hood where I used to kick doors in where I was a detective taking the drug dealers off the streets because that's all I could afford. Found myself back in the hood and then eventually found myself, I got a, do a job for $11 an hour working in a treatment center um, basically overseeing individuals at night when they slept and making sure they went to bed at night. Then I got the courage to start talking about my story on Facebook. And I said, you know what? If I'm going to start to help others and help myself, I need to even open up more and more and share the story and help shatter the stigma. It got so much that November 22nd, I uh, got connected with a young woman on 20, November 22nd. 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020, I met Jennifer. Jennifer and I immediately connected. And uh, six weeks later, January 2nd, 2021, we got married. We got married and I was going to commute from up north down to near Columbus, Ohio. Ironically, we're out for pizza one night. The phone rings after six days of being married. It was an owner of a treatment center from Columbus, Ohio, who read my story and wanted to give me an opportunity as a business development guy here in Columbus, Ohio. From that point, my wife and I had a lot of discussions about my story and about sharing it. She said, you know, Kyle, Kyle Overmeyer, KO, you were, you were a boxer. Let's put together KO Addiction. And there we had it to go out and share the story. So we'd put that together. And then after time, I started to begin to speak more and more, share my story. And yes, my, uh, my kids and I continue to grow and grow with a stronger relationship as we are today. Got another better job. I worked for a, um, a treatment center that was based out of Pennsylvania. And due to being an Ohio guy, I didn't want to send people out of state. I wanted to see those people get better and do something here in uh, you know, my own backyard. I ended up uh, getting offered a job with Hickory Behavioral um, Hospital, and they're based out of Indianapolis. And now we're going to open a um, treatment center in Cambridge, Ohio. And uh, here I am today with you folks and uh, getting to share my story with you great uh, individuals. And honestly, each day gets better where the last two days were spent with um, common pleas court judges who wanted to uh, meet with me. They're very intrigued by my story. And uh, being on both sides, it's been an interesting uh, life because I think I can actually relate with anybody now. <laughs> you know, I can help more people than hurt people. Wow. I would say that your story is intriguing to say the least. Um, so, so thank you for sharing all of that and, uh, you know, and allowing yourself to be vulnerable again. Um, and, and I, I mention this all the time, you know, the power of our story is really the power of connection because as we share our story, you know, we're, we're different, but similar and, and similar, but different. Um, so I'm sure a lot of us on this call can relate to some of the things you talk about either within our own lives or somebody that is close to us, family, friends, colleagues. Uh, so I definitely appreciate you sharing. And I just have a couple of questions. Uh, it says you're a certified event interventionist. Can Correct. You ex explain what that is, because I am a little bit ignorant on that. Certified. Well, actually a lot. well, you know, it's not if you've ever seen the, the show's intervention. I don't go at people hard. I kind of, I, I think in, in, in a better word, you finesse people. You know how they always right. have the good, bad cop? I'm pretty yeah. much a good cop. And what <laughs> I do is I like to actually persuade and also intrigue people to get treatment. You know, I use my story. I open up. And I think what one of the words that you said is vulnerable. And we must be vulnerable to heal and relate with others. And I never look at vulnerability as a weakness. I think it's a badge of courage. I truly do. Absolutely. And, and that's what not only helps people, but it helps them heal. 
and we must stay vulnerable. And I think that's been a real key for me, not only as a speaker, but an interventionist and who Kyle Overmeyer is today. Absolutely. Thanks. And, and one more question, just, you know, I'm with the Department of Corrections myself and I'm the volunteer coordinator. So I help bring in those 12 uh, step program volunteers, you know, with somebody who's walked that path, trying to get that message to the inmates. Did you participate in any 12 step programs, AANA, while you were locked up? All the time. I did the 12 steps three times. I actually read my NA um, just for today. Every day I got it on my phone. And uh, ironically enough, about a month ago, um, they had me come back in the prison that I did my time and spoke. And it, it, it touched a lot of guys. It made me feel good. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely see that. And, and, and you know, we, we are definitely always trying to get those programs in because, you know, we have to look at our, our incarcerated as human beings. And although some of them may have committed some horrific crimes, um, you know, we're, we're about rehabilitation, absolutely. But, you know, they need to be punished as well. So I'm glad to hear that you uh, partook in those meetings and they, they helped you. Um, do you do you conduct meetings yourself on the outside or do you just uh, attend or do you facilitate? No, um, I attend, um, you know, but one of the things that I've found key to my recovery and, and, I, and I'm very open about this, I go to therapy twice a month. Um, I think that's given me a lot of strength to overcome a lot of obstacles and boundaries and barriers that I could not break before with relationships, not only personally, but professionally as well and, uh, and spiritually too. Absolutely. And, and I caught what you said earlier that, you know, hey, you're, you're Sheriff Overmeyer, you take care of others. And I know for a lot of us in, in the military first responder arena, it's difficult for us to ask our, for help for ourselves. So a lot of times I think we just need to reframe that. We need to ask for support. You know, I, I'm not seeking help. I'm seeking support. And I know that's what helped me. Uh, but that's enough uh, question answer from me. I see some hands raised, if you don't mind, uh, Kyle. Oh, right. Uh, Paul? I'm free to ask anything. Paul? Thank you. Kyle, I, you cannot imagine how much I appreciate the courage that you exhibit in doing what you do after where you've been. That is huge. It is beyond huge. And I appreciate it immeasurably. And um, the one thing I, would be interested in hearing about if you're willing to share is uh, what part faith played in your recovery. Um, uh, to be quite honest, faith is the biggest thing. Um, I, I think without God, and I think um, without a higher power, I couldn't be sitting here talking to you. Um, a lot of people that continue to relapse or cannot move forward, I think struggle with not having a higher power and not having faith. And, and a lot of times people tiptoe around talking about religion and God, but I'm not gonna, because um, it is who I am and I wouldn't be here today without my strong faith and about God, Jesus Christ. So ultimately God comes first, then family. I'm not gonna lie. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now I'll turn it over to the staff commodore of the Northwest City Yacht Club. <laughs> All right, Chris. Hey man, thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. You kind of echo uh, what I've kind of coined as my relational uh, equation. You being vulnerable or you being vulnerable makes you authentic. You being vulnerable and authentic makes you credible. And that's when you start to earn trust. Um, and you've kind of demonstrated that. Um, <clears throat> I'll try not to get emotional here because I I, uh, I know somebody that went through what you went through <clears throat> and uh, he chose a different path. He chose to take his own life. Yeah. And um, for you, where was your courage? If you found somebody that went through what you went through, uh, and, and, and I'll say his name because I, I, I believe his 23 years uh, has earned it. Uh, 
Rick Francis Nelson with Seattle Police Department. Um, he, he, he got injured on a foot pursuit and ended up popped up on pills and it started taking him from bangers on the streets. Uh, and, that, and that got him uh, in his way and he got caught and he chose to take his own life. And I'm sure that you had a, a, a myriad of thoughts and emotions in, in going through you when that happened. What, if you know, help push you through that moment is all the different things <clears throat> tend to go through first responders heads when you hit that fight or flight when you fucked up and, and pushed you to still fight. And, and, you know, I guess for lack of better terms, take accountability and try to right the wrong to push forward. What gave you, what gave you the courage in that moment? Well, my kids for one thing. Uh, and I, and I say it all the time, you know, I screwed up royally. I really did. You know, I, I was a disgrace to my family, to my community. Um, you know, I worked so hard to be the sheriff at a young age and what they say, you know, you pissed it all away, but I didn't only have my children, but I had God and I know, and, and my, my, my rule right now for myself and another reason why I'm writing a book, I want to leave behind a legacy, not a liability for my children. And I want them, don't want them to say, oh, my dad was a sheriff, but I want them to share. He was the sheriff and now he is. You get what I say? And it's, it's create that positive narrative in life. And we all are in control of our own life. You know, we're the captains of our soul, the masters of, you know, our life. And it's all up to us. And I had to make that turn and make that choice. And I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I love when the haters say something negative. It turns me up 10 notches because I like to show people, no, they're wrong. And I'm, I'm going to be right. And I'm going to do the right thing. Thank you for sharing that. And for all of those that are on here and those that will watch in the future, we're human. First responders are human yeah. and you can make mistakes. That doesn't mean they're irredeemable. And I think Kyle's story here, uh, the power in that, if you will, shows you that you can still go on. You can be accountable, deal with the consequences and come out on the other side. Number one, alive for yourself and for your family and still be able to have that positive impact for people. Kyle, thank you so much for having the courage to share that, my friend. Thank you. Oh, thank you for what you do. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Miss Sarah? Do you want to go ahead or do you want Jennifer to go? Yeah, um, I'll just, I'll pop in. Um, you know, Kyle, I just want to say, you know, good for you. That is just the, the biggest thing on my heart. Good for you. You know, you did it. You push forward. Um, and it also is heartbreaking to me. I did a little bit of addiction counseling. Um, I, I'm not in recovery myself. So there's things that I don't feel like I really understood in some of the processes, but I really love the people that were really fighting to go forward. And it was so heartbreaking to me to hear like the kids that um, were injured in football and were put on opiates and then got addicted and then things unraveled. So I'm just, I'm really sorry about a lot of things on that part of your story. Um, and I'm, but I'm, I'm just happy to see that you dug deep and you overcome. I am curious if you were the sheriff now, after that experience, do you see things differently with now law enforcement and prison, would, would things be a little different now? Absolutely, absolutely. I see people, human beings and myself a whole different way. And, you know, I talk about God, I think this is God's plan. And, you know, a lot of things that I see, not only helping first responders and helping others, you know, I think that there's some change that needs to be made here in Ohio with um, our rehabilitation, too, in our prison system. You know, um, I think more mental health and addiction treatment needs to be in implemented instead of punishing a lot of people. And a lot of times people are quick to punish 
instead of help and understand the disease of addiction and mental health. They look at it as a flaw or a crime and it's truly a disease. That's what it is. It's a medical disease. It took me going to prison to really understand and embrace it and to be an addict himself. And thank God for that. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate you sharing all that. And I think it is amazing when you go through something like this, that you come out of it being more powerful in helping other people than you ever could have before being a, a sheriff. So Kyle, thank you for having the courage to share your story so deeply. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Jennifer. Hi. Um, I have to say, Kyle, I've been following your story for a long time. And I don't know, you and I had a brief conversation via text message months and months and months back. And um, again, hearing your story like this is just so powerful. So thank you for your, your bravery, your honesty and your truth. Um, and I just wanted to make a, a, a quick comment. You know, my husband, after 15 years of being on the force, suffered a mental health break and was hospitalized. So I understand, how, you know, you come out from that, not hearing from any of the brothers that you would have died for, and you have to make that decision. What are you going to do? Um, and, you know, do you bury yourself in it or do you fight back and push through? Um, and the man is actually sitting diagonal from me um, right now. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of the, the ability that I've seen in him to, to fight back and to grow and to, um, to thrive despite the challenges that he experienced, that is our family experience that I experienced as a spouse um, of a first responder whose job was ripped, career ripped from him um, because of mental illness. Um, so I don't know, I just, I wanted to say thank you so much for, again, um, sharing your truth and, and sharing your story here. And um, again, um, I appreciate you and, and look forward to, to talking to you more in the future. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Absolutely. Natalie? That was actually for me. So. <laughs> oh. Hey, um, hey, Kyle, it's just, it's an honor to, to just kind of have you almost in our house because every time Natalie gets on the phone with you, I'm usually there to hear the, the conversations. Um, it's going to be a phenomenal book. Uh, I mean, you've already pretty much expressed pretty much what's going to be in there. So I don't have any secrets to, to share, not to give away or whatever, but um, incredible, you know, set of events that you survived, which is kind of the whole point of why we're here, right? To survive all these things. Um, I got to do this. I got to take this opportunity to call you out though. Um, you use the word disgraced and I'm going to say that's bullshit. Okay um you didn't ask for this right um yeah you volunteered to play football and wrestle and all that kind of stuff but you didn't volunteer to get injured and get sent down a path that you had no control over so there's absolutely no disgrace in that whatsoever okay so i want you to do me a favor and quit using that word well so, well and, and you notice how i use disgrace in a past tense yes i did notice that yes i did okay uh, so i'm no longer disgraced i'm mm -hmm. empowered now so and you know you know chris and, and by the way natalie is a wonderful woman and thank god for her we're gonna this she's gonna help me i know like she helped you um write a great book and i can't wait and i'm i'm writing away natalie so i want you to know that so anyhow um you know so many people will say kyle i feel so bad for you poor you poor you no it's not God, God didn't give me a curse. He gave me a blessing to help all our other brothers and sisters that, that are first responders and people out there to, to help them and help them through things to get through, you know, these hard times and these obstacles to overcome. So I look back now, this, this was the plan for me, you know? And like I talk about being the sheriff, I used to think that was the pinnacle. That was it. That was the grandiose thing. And it's not, I still haven't seen it yet, Chris. I really haven't. It's coming. It's coming. But more than anything, I love the journey more than crossing the finish line, I think. I love the journey. And I'm sure you guys do too, because there's nothing like these days where you meet new people, you help other people, you have these kind of conversations. And I get so passionate about it. I love the journey. 
I love the taste of it. Every morning I get up and I'm just ready. And guess what? I'm not popping pills no more. Yeah. And you know what? There really is something bigger at work. And I have shared this with Sarah and all of you. Um, I didn't know that you and Jennifer had been in contact. And Jennifer actually took Chris and I in for five days earlier. And, and her husband, oh. Kevin, took us into their home because they knew we were going to be out there speaking. Um, we had no, we had never met. And here uh -huh. we are sleeping in their home. They took wonderful care of us. And then to find out she she knew about you and she had been in contact with you there's something bigger at work and and bobby too you know i'm i'm writing his story so it's just amazing how when you allow yourself to be vulnerable and share your stories and you're going in the right direction all the people that get put in your path to help you get there and it is about the journey it isn't about the finish line it's about getting um it's about the journey like you were saying so no, I agree. And I'm not going to lie. I like challenges. Challenges, they make you stronger and they make it a lot more interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. So thank you guys. And I'm just, I'm ready to do this and it's going to be great. <laughs> Outstanding. Sarah Marie. Hey, um, Kyle, well, first off, thanks for sharing your story. It's really powerful and um, really amazing. And I think you're right. You have seen so many sides of the fence um, that you can really connect um, with with a lot of different people um, that are are suffering and, and in pain um, in, in this life. And I think as a medical uh, personnel, you know, one of the first things we learn in nursing school is that pain is subjective. And I think we try so many times to put to make it objective so that we can justify it or, you know, justify treatments and justify where funds are going and that kind of stuff. And the bottom line is it's not, it's, it's subjective. You know, each person experiences pain in a, in a different way. And um, it's really unfortunate, you know, I, I, just as a nurse, um, I worked on a post ortho floor um, you know, patients having back surgeries and having 35 year olds that were just addicted to opiates and just seeing, you know, what our medical response was to pain and not really subjectively looking at the person behind the pain. And so um, I think uh, one, my question for you is kind of where along the process you know, what interventions do you think could have helped um, to, to kind of keep you from going down that road? Not saying that you shouldn't have, because I, I, str I strongly believe that our story becomes somebody else's survival. And I wholeheartedly agree with you that, you know, you, this was your purpose and this is your story and you're using it for amazing things now. Um, but I think others could benefit from hearing you know, and I teach self-defense. And so one of the things we do is we reverse engineer, <laughs> like we look at videos, reverse engineer, and we see like along those self-defense, like, okay, what, you know, what could I, what could the person have done in this situation and block and, and all of that stuff. So kind of reverse engineering your situation. Where do you think that there was opportunities one where someone could have intervened or two, what programs do we need to create to help, um, you know, officers, law, you know, fire, nursing. I mean, how many nurses? Like, I could come up with a list of nurses that suffer the same thing. You know, stealing pill pills from the Pixis and that kind of stuff. Right. Nursing homes. It's it's not uncommon. Um, it's it's coping with the pain. I mean, ultimately, at the core of all of this, we're all suffering in pain and just trying to find ways to cope with it. So. Well, you know, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, during that period, you know, as I as I as I reminisce and look back, you know, Kyle then was sc scared of asking for help. You know, now I'll ask uh, my wife because I've been locked up for four years on how to do some kind of new app or something like that. Technology has changed so much. You know, I've only been out of prison about two, two and a half years. But back then, that Kyle thought because he was the sheriff, he wore a badge, he had the wrong idea, like a lot of people, that 
first responders need to be superhuman and not feel like vulnerable at all. And I think vulnerability, like I said, is a very powerful thing. And now I think when regards to somebody like me and several others to get in and maybe have more of a, a program that people set around with first responders, even maybe monthly or weekly and have a powwow where it's a closed room where it's them. Why not have an AA or NA? Not saying that people are addicts or they're struggling, but that's where people start to get out and start to, to chit chat and open up about yeah. what's going on. You know, you know, like a lot of cops like they used to go and I used to do it, go to the bar and sit around and drink and woo about our problems. Why not bring it into the, you know, to the roll calls and the firehouses and have maybe some of those sessions where guys come in and chop it up like that. And I think when you open up vulnerability and we all know in relationships and uh, anything in life, communication is the key to success. Allow ourselves, but you got to be comfortable when you do it. And you know, first responders are a whole different creature because they only let certain people in, you know, just like nurses. And I know nurses and cops always got along because we see the same thing and dealt with them. And that's where those two, those kind of people would gravitate. They said that those kind of relationships were the best relationships and their marriage would actually last because they understand, you know, things are screwed up in life and we saw it. So I think maybe they could implement something like that where there is a program at first responders, at sheriff's office, police departments, and fire departments to get in there and chop it up and talk in a safe place. And I think safety is a big key to it all. Yeah, thank you. I was also wondering, you know, there's so many different modalities for pain relief too. And I think that's one of the things that we don't, we also don't talk about enough as far as like meditation, tapping, acupuncture, massage, yep. you know, there's so many other things too that that can be used to alleviate that physical pain. And I think the medical community, we don't uh, rely on that enough. So um, but yeah, th no, thank you. And I, I totally agree with you on those programs to open up and talk. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Janet. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing up on how you turned and you changed your narrative and how you um, looked at it from that point of view. Um, a lot of times, like the best thing that ever happened to me was a car accident that put me off work for a year because it made me sit in my, you know what? until I got it. And I think that these things show up for us and when we're not moving in the right direction, something comes in and intervenes until we get it or something else happens. So um, taking that responsibility and really looking at it and saying, okay, what does this mean? Where am I going? And how can I change that narrative and be who I want to be? And I think that what Sarah's done with the power of our story has really brought that to the fore. And so Kyle, I'm looking forward to that book too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for getting that, um, setting your alarm and waking up. <laughs> yeah, that takes some good discipline there. Uh, Chaplain Todd. Hey, Kyle. Uh, Wow, you know, and listening to your story, uh, we uh, we have a lot of parallels. Uh, I didn't end up behind bars, uh, probably just through stupid luck. And uh, my dad, who was a deputy, who uh, <clears throat> kind of ran interference uh, once for me. Um, but uh, you know, I was injured. Uh, my my firefighting career injured in a stairway collapse, so I had a physical injury. And then I had the post-traumatic stress injury and, and I ended up, you know, chemically treating myself, uh, spent 10 years in the bottom of a bag of methamphetamine, uh, smoked a lot of weed. And, you know, it's, it was interesting, even, even hanging out in uh, a nasty trailer with a bunch of meth addicts. Uh, the uh, the trailer park that the local police, the 
uh, Fife Police Department, just outside of Tacoma, Washington, referred to as Methlehem. Uh, <laughs> I was different. I was different than all these guys that were hanging out here smoking that pipe um, because uh, I was using drugs for a purpose. I was terrified to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, and, you know, my time as a firefighter um, colored this picture of people who were in addiction, uh, pulling enough dead bodies out of cars because some guy got drunk and got in a car and killed a family. Um, you know, taking a, a, uh, you know, a, a six-year-old girl to the hospital, uh, because dad was, uh, you know, was hopped up on meth and, and, and beat the child. Um, you know, you, you have that picture in your mind of, of somebody who abuses drugs or abuses alcohol. And even when I was <laughs> abusing it myself, I still thought of those other people in that way. And, um, I, uh, my therapist says, I'm not an addict in recovery because when I stopped using, I just stopped using. Um, I was a drug abuser. Uh, and, uh, the night that I spent with a 45 in my mouth, uh, was the last night I used methamphetamine. Uh, but, uh, I'm Al-Anon and it's been one of the most eye-opening experiences of my life, having a loved one who's in addiction and, uh, not only the dramatic, uh, change in how I think about someone who's an addict, but, uh, you know, what I put my family through, um, what I put my parents through when I was abusing drugs, uh, my ex-wife, my four daughters who like you, um, that was what kept me from, uh, you know, from pulling the trigger that night. Um, and uh, uh, I, uh, I'm a chaplain with the uh, First Responders Bridge, which is based in Columbus. Uh, and uh, every uh, several times a year in, in Dublin, uh, we have a, a weekend uh, retreat. I know, and, I know them quite well. And I spoke at the Westerville. They had a small conference. I know, um, I know uh, what's it called? Uh, PAV. And uh -huh. I know Mick and, and I know Mick Mick too. I know both of them. Yep. Awesome we, guys. Yeah, we grab we grab a um, pizza down at Gio Marco sometimes. So <laughs> well, I I the first time I went there was as an attendee. And uh one of the speakers there was the firefighter, and he talked about his meth addiction. And it, it it blew my mind because I just had never thought about how prevalent addiction and drug abuse is in the first responder community. We're all supposed to be, you know, upright rescuers. We don't need, like I, I have a, a poem and, and the main line in the poem is real heroes don't need saving. And, uh, and it was just such a shock uh, to hear so many first responders talk about personal addiction stories. Uh, and I think it comes from the isolation and that attitude that that real heroes don't need saving, that you're going to try. I, I equate it to a fighter pilot. Uh, and if anybody knows familiar with the term sea fit, controlled flight into terrain. Those pilots absolutely believe that they are going to fly their way out of that dive right up until the time they drill that fighter plane into the dirt. And, uh, and I think that's a lot of what happens is we just go so long uh, thinking that we can pull ourselves out of it, that, uh, that, you know, um, a lot of us end up literally in the dirt. 
um, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, like me, what you went through, and and I spent a lot of years thinking that God had forgotten all about me, and ended up in in uh, in 2020 realizing that He hadn't forgotten me at all. He was equipping me, and I think that's your story as well. Uh, that all that time, that affliction, uh, is God's boot camp, <laughs> and and now now you're fighting the real fight. And thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. What a small world, by the way, with the bridge, you know? Yeah. Good people, great organization. I got nothing I for just me. love I got nothing it. Love, love for those guys. They're great people. Absolutely. And that's why I say the power of our story equals the power of connection. Um, I, I did see we don't have any more hands up. Uh, I will toss it back to you, uh, Miss Sarah. Was Hi, that Aaron waving his appendages yeah. there? <laughs> well, I, I, I must be a TBI moment because I don't know how to get that hand up there on the graphics. But, hey, Kyle, I just want to say when you come on and you talk about your story, you know how you really wonder or you really want to make a connection with somebody that's struggling like you or have. I just want to simply say thank you. You uh, connected with me on a, on a lot of levels. So I just want to simply tell you, you obviously touched a lot of people tonight, but thank you. You have no idea what you've done for me tonight. So thank you. Just thank thank you. you. Those words mean a lot to me. All right, Aaron. I mean that. I, I, I lost everything, bro. I lost my house, my kids, my wife, everything. But, you know, just seeing you and listening to you and you're authentic and you're raw and you're real and I think you and I are both alike, man. They had me on so many antipsychotics after my TBI, man. I, I I lost everything. I lost everything. I just seeing you talk and and the passion that you have. You've connected with a lot of people, but I understand a lot of this. Shit. Not sympathize. I understand a lot of the stuff that you 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 went through, and um, I, I'm just gonna leave it at this. Thank you, thank you. You made a big difference in me tonight. You have no well, idea. Well, you know, Aaron, the way I look at it, sometimes you got to lose everything to have it all. To and, have it's it nice, all. and it's nice to see somebody like you give. I, I want to do what you're doing. I, I, I've devoted my life instead of sitting at home feeling sorry for myself and instead of collecting a paycheck for helping a state trooper doing a job and taking a noble retirement. You know, I, I, I did a lot of things that I had to swallow my pride and say it's not about me and I can share my journey and have to glorify it. But to save others from going through it. But every now and then, you know, it's nice to see somebody like you get up here and reassure me that I can still continue to say my story. And I, I don't have to feel like a piece of shit, you know, and it's nice to see somebody like you that's blazing the trail for people like me that are getting that courage and building up that courage. And, and, and it's not about Aaron Terrell. The world doesn't owe me shit. I owe, I owe the world shit. That badge didn't make me, I made that badge, but you tonight, just reaffirmed to me that I can keep trying to blaze that trail that you're blazing for me. So you're not a disgrace, brother. You're not, no, no, not at all. You're not a disgrace. You're a fucking hero in my eyes because I tell you what, I want to keep doing what you're doing and you're blazing the trail for people like me. And you have no idea what you've done for me tonight. So well, re remember two words of advice, utilize the word will and can if you got to manifest those into your life and that's what i try to do every day and that's what keeps me going aaron and i always say if i can do it you sure as hell can do it well you just manifested those words into my life tonight because I, I, you know you, you hit those stumbling blocks and you try to stay strong but every now and then it's good to see somebody like you get out there and remind me that no yeah you know what that that shit didn't define who i was and we can nope. do it you're doing it and you're empowering people like me so thanks brother it doesn't define you. It refines you. Remember that. Sure. And I appreciate you reminding me of that. Thank you. Yeah, God bless, brother. brother. You too, brother. You, you too, man. Amen. Outstanding. Now we'll throw it back to Miss Sarah. Oh, well, hey, great job facilitating, Daniel. Thank you so much. And Kyle, I have to tell you, um, this was fantastic. Again, I'm just, I'm so proud of you um, and the good that you're doing with the suffering. Um, and it's really cool, the timing, because Aaron, tomorrow, 
uh, is going to facilitate a group on suffering and silence for our first responders and veterans. So this is going to be the first group that he facilitates. Yep. And, you know, we want to have a regular place where people can just land kind of like an AA group, except for maybe suffering in silence. So I love it. I love it. Thanks. brother. Yeah. I'm excited too. really excited. So that's all I got. Thank you again, Kyle. It was wonderful. No, thank you. It, it was it was an honor and a pleasure. I love sharing. You know, I not only know I'm hopefully I'm helping people, but I'm helping myself. This is part of my recovery. This is part of my journey. And no one ever fo fully heals, but this is the process of healing. And I always say there's never perfection, only progression in life. I'm just going to cut in here real quick. Kyle, you know, imagine what the impact would be if we could teach every firefighter and every cop the serenity prayer. Yeah, you know, ironically, it's a prayer I say every day. I even got it tattooed on me, ironically. <laughs> Is that what you got in prison? <laughs> no, here, you want, here's the story. You guys want to hear this one? It'll be part of my book. My father, my first Father's Day, uh, my roommate tattooed my kids' names on my arms in memory of my kids for my first Father's Day in prison. There you go. Nice. And I got a heck of a sleep going on too. So <laughs> does, it, does everybody know the serenity prayer that's on? Yeah. Well, thanks again, Kyle. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording now and we can chat a little. Thanks again, da Daniel, too. That was great.